I just read that you guys sold out of your GameStop. Is that true before the big run-up in January? That you, you had the same narrative as all the retail crowd, but, but they, they were just a little too late, I guess, for you. Yeah, well, we, we have uh, GameStop in our deep value product, and um, I think our cost on it was around four or something. Oh. And when it got into the 70s is when we sold it, then it, of course, went to 400. <laughs> but still, try to time that top. I mean, if you bought a four and sold at 70, it doesn't sound like it's a disaster. Do you have any opinion on that stock now or any of these other kind of so-called meme stocks? Um, they're, they're not of interest right now because they're, they're sort of in the, in the grip of uh, the Reddit uh, crowd. And they're not, it's not, you're not able to actually analyze them in the same way that you would other, other things because the price is dominating the fundamentals. Well, one uh, interesting characteristic of this market, especially as the rally goes on, is what's happening to the short sellers. There was a great piece recently about what's been going on with Chanos Fund and some of the other major players in this space. Uh, their assets are dwindling. It's been a really difficult environment to short in, right? I mean, and, and you're often on the other side of a lot of these cult favorites. You guys don't mind taking the risk of, I mean, you have companies like Farfetch in your top holdings. You've been an Amazon holder forever. Um, so what do you think happens as this rally goes on if, if short selling is literally becoming, to some extent, unprofitable? Or maybe they've just been betting on the wrong sectors. Well, well short selling is always a tough, a, a tough thing because the market goes up about 70% of the time, 70% of the year, 70% of the months. And, uh, and, of course, if you're short and it goes against you, your name goes against you, then it becomes a bigger problem, a bigger part of your portfolio, whereas if you're long and you're wrong, and it's a smaller part of your portfolio. So it's, a, it's mathematically a very difficult, a, a difficult way to make a living. And so what, on the long side, what names are you interested in right now? Um, are you looking sort of through the lens of the post-pandemic period? Um, are there any emerging technologies or growth companies that you think are still attractive? Because we have been at kind of a lull with some of the higher multiple areas of this market for the last few months. Yeah, I mean, I think the market is the market's roughly fairly valued right now, which means that there's a probably a, a roughly even spread between the names that are they're too expensive and the names that the names that are too cheap. Um, you know, we, you mentioned Farfetch and we had Stitch Fix last year; those were some of our, our big winners. Farfetch is up, I think, eight times uh, from what we paid for it just about just about a year and a fraction ago. And so those those names have corrected. They're still expensive on a on a short term basis, but again, we're we're not in them for the we're not in them for the short term. I think in the SPAC area, which I think that game is largely winding down now, hmm. and many of the SPACs that came public came at, at extraordinarily expensive valuations. But now, now they've, some of them have corrected, like um, oh, a company called Desktop Metals, for example, that we, that we owned. It was 30, and now it's, now it's 11. And that's a company that is in additive manufacturing. So it's, it's, like, the, it's like 3D printing, but, but the next wave of that. So we think some of those SPACs are, are, are attractive. Metro Mile, an insurance company, next, next wave insurance company, is uh, seven right now. So we, we, like, uh, we like that one. And then there's, there's some valuation discrepancies in the overall market. I mean, I, I think that the big names, the big, the big fang stocks are all pretty attractive. But attractive. Something like, um, attractive, yeah. You know, Amazon, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook. You know, we, we own them. If we don't own Apple anymore. We should have we should have kept it. But <laughs> I think I think they're all fine. But a name like a name like Varum, which is a, a used car uh, seller over the internet, has a five billion dollar market cap with a management team that was part of what built Bookings.com, which is a hundred billion dollar market cap company. Carvana is the leader with a forty five billion dollar market cap, and Varum is about three years behind Carvana with a with a much higher return on capital hmm. model. So. That's a name we think you could make multiple times your money in the next in the next three or four years. So let me ask, as you lay all these scenarios out, are you concerned about being invested in stocks uh, in general right now when we're talking about 19 percent budget deficits, uh, huge uh, debt numbers and open questions about which way inflation and rates are headed? Uh, no, n not not at all. I mean, it, w in terms of in terms of that stuff, when uh, you might have asked me before what I worry about and, and my general comment is I really don't worry about much of anything because everybody else is always out there worrying about everything. So they've got the worry covered in the overall, in the overall market. I think we're just looking for opportunities you know, in, that, in, the, in the market. And I think there's, there's plenty of them out there. I mean, I think, you know, General Motors is, is I think, very, very attractive with the new CFO. Uh, Paul Jacobson, who came from Delta, were a very creative C CFO at Delta. And, and GM, I love the lineup. I think Mary Bear has got a great strategy. And and the, the, the valuation discrepancy between it and, um, and Tesla is just, is just way too big. Do you think interest rates are going higher? I mean, do you have to change your investments to take that into account if so? You know, it's, it's the 30-year Treasury was down almost 10% in the first quarter. And for something that's supposed to protect you uh, and, and, and be a bulwark in your portfolio, 
That's the worst quarter in 40 years for the 30-year Treasury. There's only one other quarter in history that was worse than that, and that was in, in, in 1980 when inflation was in the process of peaking. So I, I think the Treasuries in general, so that I think the 10 years backed off from the 175, but the Fed, the Fed wants inflation to run hot for a while, meaning over, over 2%. So it's a negative, negative rate of return. I don't see why anybody would own those, but, but there's a massive amount of money that flowed into, into bonds over the past 10 years because we were in the midst of a gigantic bond bull market, which mm -hmm. I think is over. So let me ask you one more question about all this, and I just want to go back to the, the deficit issue. How, how does it get resolved? How do we go from 19% deficits to, some, to a figure much smaller? Um, and is that going to be the kind of resolution that constrains growth, or whether it's in particular states or parts of the country or just overall? I'm just curious if you have any concern about that. Um, I, I, again, I don't because it's unknowable. Um, you know, Larry Summers has a, 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 only a one-third chance that the this current this current stimulus program won't end badly one way or the other, and on the other side is you know uh, Chairman Powell and Secretary Yellen who who uh, are not worried about it, and Paul Krugman either. So you've got a lot of economic heavyweights out there with very different opinions, and and I don't think that uh, I don't think it's clear what what the ultimate outcome is going to be, but. We don't have to wait to see that. We know what's going on right now, and right now, you know, inflation is not a problem, and we're going to have a big boom this year with this with the stimulus and on top of the uh, the reopening of the economy. Yeah. So then, let me circle back to crypto, which is kind of related to all of these questions, because there are people in it because their case is, you know, we're going to see dollar debasement and all of these different things, and there, I, I think, increasingly, are people in it after hearing what you and Stan Druckenmiller said last fall and realizing the institutional interest is just going to keep growing and growing, and they just figure they'll ride that wave. Um, Bitcoin is now up, I think, three. See, when we spoke, I want to say it was around 14. So it's up about four times uh, since we spoke in value. How much more upside is there? Even if you think there's upside, is there a lot more upside, do you think? You know, I, I, it's too bad we had, um, we had uh, video difficulties because I was going to have my Bitcoin hat on when you answered that. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <My baseball cap. laughs> but. Um, yeah, so I mean, Bitcoin. There, there are many, many different ways to look at Bitcoin. The simplest one is just supply and demand. You mentioned uh, the mainstreaming of it and uh, the institutional acceptance of it, uh, and I think you know supply is growing two percent a year, and demand is growing faster. That's all you really need to know, and that means it's going higher. So I think that um, you know it's going to have these kinds of uh, volatile days. It was down twenty percent peak to trough over the weekend, but back in two thousand seventeen, which which was a bubble. I don't think I don't think this is a bubble at all in Bitcoin. I think this is now. The beginning of, of a mainstream mainstreaming of it, but um, even back then during the bubble, it went down 20 percent on five different occasions. So volatility is with with Bitcoin. Volatility is the price you pay for for mm. performance. And and I think that you know if it if it it's I think it's like digital gold. That's the, that's the first stop in it. And gold is about a 10 trillion dollar asset category, and and Bitcoin's one one trillion dollars, and um, it's it's infinitely divisible or almost so. It's easily transportable and can be sent anywhere in the world if you have a smartphone. So it is, it is a much better version as a store of value than gold. And then so, there's $15 trillion of negative yielding uh, of bonds out there. Why would you have that when you could own something that at least has, a, has the potential to go up? Mm -hmm. And do all of these arguments then extend to other cryptos? You know, a lot of people are now, you know, <laughs> I look at whether it's videos on social media or you name it, I mean, there's this constant interest in chasing the next big crypto performer, and a lot of them are up even more, I mean, way more in some cases than Bitcoin. Do you dabble in any of those, or do you just stick with Bitcoin? No, I, I don't, I don't um, fiddle around with any of, any of those others. There's a, there's a lot of good theoretical work done on, on uh, lock-in and path dependence in technologies. Brian Arthur at Stanford is one of the, one of the leaders in that area. He's also written another book called The Nature of Technology. But effectively, when, when you have a technology uh, like Bitcoin, there's, what happens is that there's an there's a explosion of new, uh, new technologies that come along with it. So now we have about what, eight or 10,000 of these ICOs. But eventually, eventually the, those things lock in, and there's a dominant company which is, or, or, or a dominant entity. Mm. And that's why, that's why the antitrust people are going after Amazon and uh, Google and Facebook and and because those those companies are so dominant, and I think Bitcoin will be the dominant technology in this uh, in this emerging asset category.